Star Tours announces another of our exciting action adventure tours. That's right, my friends. Why don't you come on in while we just do a final systems check? Just a few routine. Hey, Mo! Hey, Mo! Hey, Mo! Don't worry. This is all part of the demonstration. Just testing. W. Radio. Your information station. Hello, my friends, and welcome to the WDW Radio Show. Your Walt Disney World Information Station. I am your host, Lou Mangello, and this is show number 347 for the week of January 19th, 2014. I am here to help you have the best possible Disney vacation experience and bring you a little bit of Disney magic wherever you are with this podcast, my videos, blog, live broadcasts, special events, my Walt Disney World trivia books, CDs, and more. You can find everything over at www.radio.com. And this week's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com, where you can get a free audiobook download by visiting audibletrial.com slash Radio. There's more than 100,000 titles to choose from. Lots of Disney books as well, too, for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. All you need to do is sign up, get your free book. You can cancel anytime. Sign up for free over at audibletrial.com slash Radio. So I believe that one of the best ways to learn about a culture and people is to obviously visit their home country. But the next best thing is to tour World Showcase in Epcot. But an even better way to really understand and appreciate them is by enjoying and really understanding their popular foods. Well, this week, we're going to visit the Rose and Crown Pub in Epcot's United Kingdom Pavilion with someone who calls England home for a live restaurant review. We'll not only sample a number of items from the dinner and drink menu, but get a sense of just how authentic the pub and these dishes really are. I'll then have the answer to our last Walt Disney World trivia question of the week and pose a new challenge for your chance to win a Disney prize package. Then stay tuned as I'll have some updates and announcements, including information about the WDW Radio 7th anniversary party and live show that I want you to attend and be a part of course i'll have more of your voicemails at the end of the show so sit back relax and enjoy this week's episode of the wdw radio show I've always believed and said on the show that one of the best ways to learn about and really appreciate a culture is not just through its people, but th- through its food. And one of the best places to do that, obviously in Walt Disney World, is by wandering the promenade and dining and snacking and drinking your way around World Showcase. And we've actually talked in the past about how well the countries actually reflect the nations that they are modeled after. And I'm actually standing outside the Rose and Crown Pub here at the United Kingdom in Epcot on a beautiful January night. I love the winters here in Florida. And remembering how we walked through this pavilion at length, talking about the details and the stories and how well it really translated from jolly old England. And many years ago, and I'll link to it in the show notes, I walked around with someone who ended up becoming a good friend, Emma from the United Kingdom, and she is back again Welcome. Hello, Lou. It's great to be back. God save the Queen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we had a blast walking through the pavilion and really sort of taking our time talking about the architecture and the history and sort of how much it really re- reflects. And we understand it's sort of a Disney-fied version of what these pavilions are. But I think one of the things that we didn't get to do, save for a little fish and chips on the back end at Yorkshire County, is really sort of appreciate not just how well some place like the Rose and Crown reflects the architecture and maybe a place that we'd see in the United Kingdom, but let's get to the food. Let's see how well the food inside is like what you would have back home. That's it. We'll see if it's typical English grub. (laughs) Is that what you call pub grub? Is it pub grub? Yeah, food grub. (laughs) So talk to me first about the pub itself. You know, we're sort of, again, on sort of a Disney-fied version of a a United Kingdom street corner, and, and I understand that the pub really sort of reflects 
you know, a number of different architectural styles and pub styles. Tell me how this would compare to something that you might find back home. I think that the, probably the pub is the most current and realistic thing in the UK pavilion um, you know we do have sort of chain pubs but we do still have very traditional pubs in most towns cities villages um, and most people sort of have tend to have their local pub which is the one that they always return to and and that's what the Rose and Crown looks like to me right and obviously the United Kingdom and England is, is a is a huge country ultimately speaking with a lot of different you know, uh, styles and, you know, again, you said there's big cities. You don't live in London. You live in Norwich. That's right, <laughs> yes. Norwich, Norfolk. And I have my actually, uh, you actually were kind enough to bring me my Norwich translation guide so I can understand half of what you're saying. But uh, this, is again, the kind of pubs you'd see would really sort of vary on where you are in the country. This might not be something that you'd see in downtown London. That's correct. I mean, again, it, you know, there is this fashion for sort of traditionalist. So um, places where there are uh, sort of tourism as well, you will find these pubs cropping up again. Um, and of course, you know, obviously I can only speak on sort of in regards to England, but you've got obviously like Scotland, um, again, a lot of traditional places will be around those kind of places as well. So you, you will see this a lot, I think. Okay. So we're going we're gonna to actually go inside. We're going to have dinner here because I want to know what to order and how well it compares. I want to really sort of go through the menu. Again, the things that we do for the show, I want to go through the menu <laughs> item by item and see sort of how they compare. And even as we go through, tell me some of the things that you see that say, so yeah, this is something that is very much like a pub back home. You know, is the Guinness, you know, is it served at just the right temperature? Like that's, that's a thing, isn't it? It is, yeah. I mean, um, unfortunately, I don't drink alcohol, so I guess you're going to have to do all the <laughs> testing. Um, but yes, you know, it is very much like the the Guinness has to be the right temperature, the lager has to be the right sort of fizziness, I suppose. You know, we, you know, in the UK, they take drinking seriously. I, I, that's what I understand. <laughs> all right, so we're going to go and check in um, and go sit down, and we're going to come back and re- sort of share our live dining review not just of the food at the Rosen Crown but reflecting on how the Rosen Crown might be what you'd find back in jolly old England we will be right back everyone sounds really posh <laughs> so the first thing that Emma noticed as we were checking in and getting seated at our table is exactly what you just said you said you you know we in the United States we can tell if someone is from the south or from the northeast or from the northwest what the first thing you said is everyone sounds so posh yeah it's really strange I mean obviously there are people that have got um, strong accents from certain areas in the UK and then there are some accents that perhaps I wouldn't be able to put actually where they're from obviously it helps here because you can see on their name badges where they're actually positioned um, but it's really strange after spending a week here sort of listening to the American accents even I'm noticing that the English accents sound really well spoken <laughs> Yeah, you said everybody sort of has their own little, uh, you know, bits of, of changes in dialect and, and words that they use, and sometimes you guys sound like you're com- speaking a completely foreign language to me. But we, uh, before we got seated, we went into the pub area of the Rosen Crown. We were uh, we had a great chance to see uh, Carol, the Hat Lady, who was playing piano. Love her. She's such a great live entertainer. Been here for a long, long time. I interviewed her a while back. I'll have to link that in the show notes too, talking about um, her experiences here at the Rosen Crown and, and throughout. Walt Disney World, but you know, you were saying that as you sort of looked around, it's not too far from what you might see, you know, in, in some places in the UK. Yeah, I think um, I think people have um, traditional pubs that they like to go to. Um, that you know, you will have the pub that's your local that you like to go to, and I think there are a lot of people that are traditionalists and they like to walk into a pub that looks like this. Um, you can sit at the bar, you can sit in your, your table and feel at home, really. And so a lot of the pubs are like this. There's there's sort of a bar area, and they have restaurants, uh, you know, associated with them too. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think that the the food thing is is in most pubs now, um, but I think that there's a there's almost like two different types of customer. There's the customer that does just go to spend the evening and have a few drinks away from home, um, and then it, pubs are quite popular on a Sunday for Sunday dinner. That's kind of like a you, you sort of roast 
dinner, that's quite a favourite, going to the pub on a Sunday lunchtime for your roast dinner. I think that's quite popular. So is there a sort of... Tr- now, before we even look at the menu, like is there a traditional pub food? Like here in the United States, again, we're, we're overgeneralizing, I understand, but, you know, if you go to a bar or something like that, and the food there is usually, think, like chicken wings or french fries or sliders and stuff like that, is there, like, sort of traditional pub food? You know that when you go to a pub, you can get chips or fish or whatever it might be? Yeah, I think so. And again, it's very regional. You know, obviously there's going to be different things you can get in different regions. Um, You know, Northern Ireland may be completely different from what you get in in Wales or something like that. So obviously here they've generalised. But yes, uh, on a Sunday you'd expect a a pub to do a Sunday roast dinner and that will be very popular. Quite a lot of pubs have like curry nights. So they'll have like an Indian curry night and that's quite a draw for people as well um, and then you've got your standard like sort of, uh, sandwiches and scampi and chips okay. that kind of thing so um, yeah and, and also you'll find that certain pubs specialise in certain things you know you know to go to that pub because they do do a good Sunday roast or something like that. And are there like sort of your local pubs and are there like chain pubs like franchise pub like the TGI Fridays of UK pub? very much so yes there's um there's one chain again I, you know i don't know if it's across the whole of uk but there's one chain that's kind of dominated sort of towns and cities over the last few years and they're quite well known for their prices very cheap very sort of buy two get one free um burger meals and they definitely do a curry night um and they're very popular with just getting there sitting down for lots of drink and lots of food so it's interesting you, t- you keep mentioning the curry and the Indian. That's one thing that I, being ignorant, never sort of associated with, you know, UK food is, is Indian, that Indian curry spice. Yeah, it's. Um, I think that, you know, it's sort of like the Sunday roast dinner, fish and chips and Indian takeaway, you know. They're almost like popular meals, um, certainly sort of in, in the England kind of area as well. So very popular. All right, so let's start looking through the menu and see how well it compares. I, f- I f- kind of want you to read the menu just because I love your accent. <laughs> let's sort of go through the appetizers first. They have roasted sea scallops, a trio of United Kingdom cheese with accompaniments, the St. James smoked salmon, an English chicory and watercress salad, a scotch egg. All right, a scotch egg. It, the, the description here is a... Golden fried hard boiled egg wrapped in a sausage meat with mustard sauce for nine forty nine. Explain to me the Scotch egg because I know this is the one thing that people love coming in to try. I find it really strange that they serve <laughs> this as an appetizer. Now, obviously, I don't know what the history is of a Scotch egg. All I know is that personally, it's um, like a picnic food. Um, like, so you might have it if you're having um, a cold dinner. So you might have salad and cold meats, and quite often you'll have a Scotch egg as well. Um, um, or if you're going out on a picnic and you take like a little packed lunch, Scotch eggs quite popular. Um, but again, you know, uh, perhaps sort of your listeners might be able to say what the origin of a Scotch egg is. But um, I've I've certainly never seen it as an appetizer on a on a proper sort of sit down menu. Hmm. So is there anything that you see on the appetizer menu that's like, yeah, this is something you'd find in a pub, or this is something that we would normally have as an appetizer? Maybe quite a posh pub. <laughs> um, I think that the cheese would normally be after your dessert. I don't think it would be an appetizer. So I'm quite interested to see that and see what it's served with. I'm wondering whether it's it's served with pickle and and stuff like that. Um, sea scallops probably uh, again it would have to be a certain type of pub so um it's it's been quite fashionable to have sort of like gastro pubs especially in london and places like that where you're going um more for the food so um they're probably not decorated like this um it's more for the food and you're going for the high-end kind of menus um uh, again, the other things um, are perhaps not standard appetizers, um, but it'd be interesting to see what, what they're like. I don't even know what a chicory is. 
Neither do I. <laughs> we need to get Holly back here. So we're going to end up eating a lot just because I think we have to try. So what do you say? Should we try a scotch egg to see how authentic and just out of curiosity, the trio of UK cheeses? All right. So we're going to talk to our server, Holly, some more. And I want to talk to her about her take on the menu and things that she likes and special. Uh, and speaking of Holly, who's all the way from Northampton, Northampton. Yeah, which is right in the middle of England. It's about an hour north of London. Uh, the UK is approximately the same size as uh, Florida is, and Northampton is where Orlando is. So smack bang in the middle. And the weather's pretty much the same in both Orlando and UK. There is a small difference, uh, generally the amount of cloud cover. Uh, so but right now, where we're having a cold snap, the weather is pretty similar. Uh, so we picked a nice day. It's overcast, a little rainy, so you guys must just feel like you're home. Yeah. Well, it's not. It's the World Showcase. We actually have a, like a weather simulator that goes around the showcase. So you came on a day where it's UK. So it just so happens we have a lot more sunny locations on the showcase than rainy ones. So I love it. And with the smile. So we were just going through the menu and going through some of the appetizers, talking about the uh, the idea of, of a scotch egg, which Emma says is something normally you'd find like on a picnic. Yeah. And you, so you agree. And she's curious about your trio of United Kingdom cheeses. Okay, so currently on our cheese plate, we have a Cashel Blue, which is an Irish cheese. It's very similar to a Stilton, comes with a honey drizzle. We pair it with candied craisins and walnuts. Then we have an Irish cheddar, which is a very mild cheddar that we pair with an onion jam. And we have a Cotswold, which is a cheddar with chives. And then we pair that with some pickles and then a sunflower muesli bread on the side. Emma smiled and was nodding when he said she wanted to know if you were going to serve with pickles. Yeah, I mean, because again, it's that when you think about cheese being served in the UK, we sort of think about ploughmans yeah. and like our sort of pickle, cheese and pickle sandwiches. Yeah, okay, yeah. So as soon as I sort of saw the cheese, I thought, I wonder if yeah. it's served with pickles. And we do actually have a ploughman's on our lunchtime menu, okay. so yeah. And she said it's normally something you would think of cheese almost as an after your entree. Yes. A lot of British couples will come in and they'll actually have the cheese afterwards. So you have cheese and wine course. Okay. So we have the first there's three courses in the UK, which is the same as we have here, and then we always follow it up with a, a cheese course, and then a port or a sherry or a dessert wine. So Emma was very happy to see, because we were talking about it, which was news to me that um, you have a lot of, in the UK, you have a lot of curry dishes, which is not something I normally associate, but you have an Indian-style chicken marsala and a vegetable curry as well. Uh, yeah, at the moment, the uh, masala is actually, although it's an Indian dish, uh, the masala is actually native to the UK. Is If you go to India, you can't actually order a chicken masala because they invented it within the UK itself. Uh, we have it on the menu because of the fact that we have fish and chips as the number one takeout, but follow, after that, it's followed by Indian food, So, which every year gets a little bit closer to the chippy like on the Mount Eaton. So. Do you have chip butties? <laughs> no, we don't have chip butties here, unfortunately, <laughs> but I do know a few pubs in Orlando that you can get them. Emma's been telling me for years years about chip butties and I have yet to I don't even know what one would look like if I ate one but I've explained that obviously there's two different ways there's the the people that have the bread yeah. with with chips and then there's the ones that will only have a roll okay, and yeah, chips so yeah I, I'm a I'm a kind of roll person myself yeah that's it you get the roll put a nice bit of butter in there good lot of chips ketchup vinegar whichever you fancy so chips <laughs> which we call french fries so it, it basically is a french fry sandwich yeah. oh my god I've got to go move to the United <laughs> Kingdom why I find it bizarre that the Americans haven't come across it. It's like Easter eggs. I don't understand how Americans haven't got onto the idea of Easter eggs and advent calendars. So, so uh, else on the menu is a grilled New York strip and fried fish, uh, a casserole of artisanal lamb, again the fish and chips, corned beef and cabbage. The fish of the day is? It's a salmon. It's a Scottish salmon. We then... Uh, pan sear it we put it on a bed of fingling potatoes and then it's got a cream sauce with it it's a very light dish very like sort of very light and fluffy almost and a grilled New York steak so you have sort of the very simple steak items for people who maybe don't want to get too adventurous you've got the fish and chips you've got the Indian how does this compare to, both of you guys can tell me how do you think this compares to traditional pub menu it's very similar to a very traditional pub menu actually British cuisine isn't a particularly adventurous cuisine we like a lot of very simple very comfort foods because of the weather situation we tend to eat a lot more heavier dishes uh, whereas if you were to go to Italy or the Mediterranean it's much more light based olives salads and things like that in the UK it's a lot of pies a lot of lasagnas and things like that and steak as well is very very popular at home uh, as well as being a farming community so there's a lot there's a abundance of beef and lamb is generally is a staple in the UK as a dish and Holly what's your personal favourite item on the menu oh my personal favourite is the uh, lamb 
is the artisanal casserole. Uh, it's like an upmarket shepherd's pie. So we use really nice chunks of lamb min- min- meat, sorry, rather than mince. Then we roast off some vegetables, cook it all in a gravy, and then we put a potato pancake on top. Hello. Yeah. And for side orders, I don't even know what language these are in. Mushy peas and bubble and squeak. Yes. Uh, the mushy peas we make in-house, so we uh, take garden What's a mushy pea? It's uh, take garden peas, we add a little bit of cream to it, a few herbs and spices, then we literally just mush them all up. They'll come out with the same consistency as mashed potato. Wow. Emma's giving thumbs up and nodding her head like, yeah, we're getting the mushy peas. Yeah. Very traditionally had with your fish and chips. The bubble and squeak is mashed potatoes, bacon and cabbage. We mix it all together, cook it off, and then we cover it in gravy. It gets the name from at the point that the mashed potato would be bubbling as you were cooking, cooking it. The cabbage will start letting out a squeaking noise. We like to use descriptive words to describe our dishes. The same as bangers and mash. It's a sausage is known as a banger because 50 years ago, the sausage, if you didn't pierce it, would explode in the oven. So it would go bang. I have learned so much tonight. I haven't even eaten anything. So there's no blood sausage. No blood. Sausage. There is an army. There used to be. There used to be a blood sausage on the menu. Yeah. Yeah. We change our menu every six months, uh, so it constantly is evolving. Uh, but no, right now there isn't a blood pudding or a blood sausage on that. But we do make homemade sausages uh, at lunchtime for our bangers and mash. Years ago, I did a video of the UK, and I was outside with. The, the chef, I don't remember, it was it was Chris or Christian. I don't, Christian. Uh, Christian. Uh, chef Christian is now an executive chef here at Disney World. Okay. He's actually at Golden Oaks. Um, at the Yeah, he is very high up in the company now. Oh. He is a fan. I, I love Chef Christian. I've been here now for nearly eight years. Well, we had a, they brought out tons of food outside and the cheese and we had sampled everything. And it was the most beautiful, glorious meal of my life. And as we're getting ready to finish up... Were you sitting down on the corner of Lower Deck? I was. I've seen the video on YouTube. (laughs) (laughs) That's too funny. I kid you not. (laughs) I was like, I've definitely seen that video. And we loved it. Except at the end, I'm like, ooh, I haven't tried this. And as I'm walking away, I grabbed a piece of blood sausage. Not the last thing you want to eat. No, it's not. Not probably the thing to top your meal off no. with. Normally, we'd recommend the sticky toffee pudding as something just to finish it. But it's, it's, an, it's an acquired taste. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's a, it's um, you know it's that kind of popular in Scotland. Yes, yeah, so the Scots like those sort of odd things. So yeah. All right, so Emma, what are you thinking? I, I'm gonna I'm gonna just throw this out there. You tell me what you think. A Scotch egg and the cheese for yes, appetizers. Yes. Yeah. What are you thinking for your entree? And just so you know, whatever you order, I'm going to try some. (laughs) Well, I feel like we should try the fish and chips. Um, But then we've had the fish and chips outside, haven't we? So We actually use different fishes inside versus outside. Outside they use, um, it's a type of catfish uh, called pangazi. In here we use a North Atlantic cod. So it's a much whiter fish, a much more flaky fish. That's why outside you'll get two pieces, uh, whereas inside here you get one. Do we want, we should really have the masala, shouldn't we? Yeah, I was going to say, maybe we should have the Indian style masala and you tell me. I'm adventurous. Look at look at me. I'll eat anything. Well, I personally, if you're not sure, I recommend the steak and fish because the steak is the same one as the New York strip steak that you get down here. You actually, the fried fish on it is the fish from the fish and chips. So if you've got that and the curry, then essentially you've almost got three dishes that way. Plus you get our homemade Yorkshire pudding. I almost thought about getting the lamb because you did but I'm not sure if Emma's like digging the lamb I think um, <laughs> it would be quite good to try a Yorkshire pudding if you if you haven't had a Yorkshire pudding before which comes with okay. the, the the fish so you think the steak and the fish and the chicken marsala yeah. I think that would be a good call yeah. and, and I, we have to get a side order so do we go mushy peas or bubble and, or, or both well, we'd recommend both, obviously. <laughs> um, well, I'm a mushy pea kind okay, yeah. of girl, very much so. So. Right, so I think we have to do the mushy pea. No problem. How would you guys like your steak cooked? Medium? Yeah. Yeah? Sure. <laughs> no problem. I'll get this to you right away, guys. Thank you. I'll leave you the menu. Thank you very much. God Thank save you. the queen. I am so excited. I'm so happy we came here hungry. Um, yeah, and then we'll obviously get to dessert later because I'm sure... You're going to rec- It looks like sticky toffee pudding is just what we're supposed to get. Uh, we should mention, too, that on the opposite side of the menu, there is a huge um, beer and wine and ale and lager. I don't know the difference between any of those. Ale, lager, and stout menu, as well as um, sangrias and non-alcoholics. So they have Bass, Stella, Harp, Boddington's English Pub Ale. You're nodding like that's a, a Strongbow Cider and a Guinness Stout. Um, I'm not a Guinness guy. It's like drinking charcoal to me, but I know a lot of people, that's that's their thing. 
Yeah, I think um, Guinness is is very popular. I used to drink it sort of when I did used to drink um, uh, I, uh, sort of half a pint of Guinness is quite nice. It's not a refreshing drink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it is quite heavy. What I'm also quite interested in the, is these pub blends. Yeah. Um, so they've actually mixed things like half a Stella and, and half a, a, an ale. Um, I mean, I've... I've heard of um, cider and black, so that's one. The cider mm-hmm. with a shot of black currant, um, that's quite popular, um, especially sort of with the sort of sort of when you first start drinking kind of thing. So if you go to nightclubs and that kind of thing, okay. um, cider and black. But some of these others I haven't heard of before. So and snake bite, that's another one that's quite popular. Yeah, but um, like the half a Boddington's and half a Guinness, the Bumblebee. Um, again, I'd be interested to know if, if that is something that's common. So should I try one just for the sake of... I'd be interested in try like a cider and black or a snake bite. Like, are men allowed to drink that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, um, it's uh, obviously in the UK we can start drinking from when we're eighteen, and um, when you sort of when you're eighteen and you start drinking, it's normally when you're going to sort of um, going to watch live bands and going to nightclubs. And I know certainly sort of you know in in the scene that I'm into with sort of like rock music and stuff, cider and black and snake bite is very popular with uh, the 18 year olds Uh, they also have uh, a number of different scotch flights scotch whiskeys they have Johnny Walker Blue Macallan 12 or 18 year Lagoon Oban I can't even pronounce half of them a number of different scotch whiskeys with two ounce pours so yeah maybe just in the interest of research what do you think a cider and black or a snake bite what do you think is the one that I should ooh um Go for the snake bite. The snake bite. All right. All right. I'll be adventurous. I'll try anything once. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm very curious. I am very curious now. All right. So I'm going to, when she comes back, I'm going to order a snake bite. So Holly just brought us our, this is obviously the scotch egg, which is nothing like what I expected it to be. Uh, I'll take a picture of it, but it basically looks like a giant fried ostrich egg wrapped in... Meat. Yep. So what it is, it's a hard-boiled egg. We, t- we su- You can have any size egg you like, because at home you'll get very small ones, which are quail's eggs, up to large eggs. Here we use a large size egg. We then hard-boil it, wrap it in sausage meat. So you cook the sausage meat three-quarters of the way through, so that it's still malleable, but it's almost cooked. Pack it around the egg as big as you want, or as small as you like, then roll it in breadcrumbs. You then flash fry it, so deep fry it, for just a few seconds, just to cook it all the way through, and then we put it in the oven. That way it drains the, the uh, grease off it. A lot of places you go, they'll purely fry them, but they'll end up very greasy. So here we like to cook ours off in the oven, just to save some. So it's healthy. I wouldn't go that far. Uh, Scotch eggs can be eaten hot or cold. Here we serve them hot. But a lot of places you'll actually be able to pick them up in the supermarket in the fridge section, ready to go. So kids often have them as part of their packed lunch. So it's, you would normally eat it like with your hands? Like it's a, yeah. it's a finger? Yep, yeah, it's a finger food. So I say, especially the small ones, whenever you have like a family get together, like a picnic or any of those where you're doing like a cold buffet, you'll always have a big bowl of Scotch eggs. So here am I supposed to eat this with a knife and fork? I want to do it the right way so you don't laugh at me. Is it a knife and fork food? or is it a- uh, Here it is because it's a larger egg. You generally, otherwise you end up eating it like an apple and no one ever looks quite so good doing that unless you're trying to do like a Tudor kind of thing. So, but yeah. And these two little things next to uh, That's actually toast, but in the UK it's known as soldiers. So Soldiers? Soldiers, yeah. So when you ever have a hard, like a hard-boiled egg in the morning, where you take the top off, you've got your soldiers next to it. They go in your... So here, they're represented on the side. And then you've got a small watercress salad uh, with a vinaigrette dressing on it. And underneath is a bed of mustard. We like a lot of spicy mustards in the UK, so it's got a good taste flavor to it. And there's a whole lot of stuff going on in your cheese plate, too. And again, I'm going to take pictures of these, and I'll put them in the show notes, too. All right, so the one closest here is the blue. It's the cashel from Ireland with a honey drizzle paired with candied raisins and walnuts. Then you've got the Irish cheddar, which is the square one in the middle, with the onion jam, and the Cotswold, which is the cheddar with chives with the pickles on the side, and the sunflower muesli bread. So just to make sure I've got it down right, I take a little bit of the cheese with whatever it comes with, put yep. it on the little bread. A little bit of bread, that's it. We put it on the crackers, just like you're doing often here. Add it, and then we just paired them up with the appropriate accompaniment. And Emma has convinced me that if I'm going to do this, I need to do it right. 
So I'm going to have a snake bite? Yes. I'm going to have a snake bite. Yeah. <laughs> Very good call on that one. Yep, a snake bite, certainly. Anything else I can get for you guys at the moment? I think we're good. I'm ready. I'm excited. I'll be right back with you. All right. <clears throat> now, I, you go first. I'll let you go first so you can tell me how authentic it is, and I'll just judge by your reaction. Okay, I was really surprised that um, the Scotch egg is, is hot. I hadn't, e- hadn't even thought about it. Um, as Holly said, because they're normally served as a sort of like snack, um, a packed lunch item, um, I've always just thought of them as being chilled. Um, but so it's going to be really interesting to eat, eat a, a warm Scotch egg. And typical dork tourist podcaster i'm photographing our food before we dig in all right so go ahead dig into the dig into your scotch egg let's see yeah it's nice um the um the sausage meat around it is quite thin, so you get the taste of um, the egg quite strongly. Um, it's really nice. Um, it's a very different taste being warm. That's really interesting. Um, but yeah, it's quite authentic. All right, I need to check this out. I'm excited. So I want to make sure I get a little bit of everything on there, egg and sausage and mustard, and then I'll come back for a soldier after... Oh, yeah, I like that. That's really good. Oh, wait a minute. I want to have this again. Hold on. <laughs> it's um, it's almost like a little breakfast sandwich. Mm-hmm. 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 That's really good. How are you? So, yeah, this is like... It's, it's like... A yummy, warm breakfast on a fork. Mm. And we have a our chicory salad with watercress. It looks like I'm eating four-leaf clover, clovers. I've never. I don't even know what a chicory is. It looks like a weed, but. Mm-hmm. It's nice, it's light, but it's taking me away from the, from the scotch egg. I like what she said about the soldiers, um, because uh, that uh, perhaps people wouldn't know, um, wouldn't relate that, but the whole point is, is that as, as Holly said, that the um, boiled eggs, you do them so that they're still, the yolk is still runny in the middle. And so normally you dip your soldier, which is your piece of bread, you dip that into the yolk of the egg. So it's not something that you would normally have with scotch eggs, but what they've done is they've put the two together, so the, the soldiers and the boiled egg, and they've put it with the scotch egg. So it's, it's a nice touch. And a, and a soldier looks like... It doesn't look like a piece of toast. It's a, it looks like a, a Jenga block. That's the only way I can associate it. But it's a very dense, and it's not like a white toast. I don't know what kind of a, a bread this is. It could, I mean, uh, traditionally it's any any type of bread. I think normally it's just um, at home you'll have sliced bread and you toast it and you cut it up into into fingers, basically. And then you, you use that to dip into your, into your hard-boiled egg. Emma, don't be shy because I'm going to keep on eating this scotch egg. And if you stop, I'm just going to keep on going. I like it with the mustard, too. Like, I could come in here and have just a couple appetizers like this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really tasty. That's good. And the scotch egg is nine forty nine. But again, it's it's obviously big enough that two people could share too. Yeah, you'd think because um, it uh, again, it's quite a common snack food. So you'll go into supermarkets and you can buy packs of them quite cheaply. 
Um, so yeah, you would think looking at the price of that that it was like, oh, that's quite expensive for a Scotch egg. Um, but actually, the way that it is made. Um, the taste is lovely and you and you can tell that it's you know there is enough there to share as an appetizer holly i'm in love uh, with you and the scotch egg <laughs> that is so good i say the scotch egg is one of those ones that a lot of people see it on the menu are very confused by it a little questioning of it but actually it tastes really really good so. and you just brought me a snake bite which is a cider so it is the um it's the strongbow cider it's topped with harp Harp lager, yes. So what it is, is the lager is a light beer. Uh, The harp is made by the same company as Guinness, so it's an Irish lager. The cider is an English uh, cider, which is a strongbow. So it kind of lightens the two up. It gives it a really refreshing taste to it. I'm going to wash down my scotch egg with a little... um... Enjoy. Thank Thank you. you. Ooh. I'm not normally a a big beer drinker, um, but that's nice. It's not... There's no sort of bitterness to it. It is. It's almost... It's almost sweet. You know, you really sort of get the sweetness of the cider there. That and a scotch egg, I'm good. Yeah, I think um, because cider, because cider is a, a sweet drink normally, I think that's why it's quite popular with the sort of new drinkers, the teenagers. Perhaps it's kind of a bit easier to mix the, the lager and the, and the cider together. Makes it quite refreshing as well. That's nice in the summer. One of those and a couple of these here. I'll split this last piece of scotch egg with you, and then we're gonna we gotta hit the cheese because we have a lot of food coming tonight. Mm. That is a new big fan favorite of mine. The, the scotch egg. I will I will come back just for that. So let's move this out of the way now that we've done all the damage and uh, and hit our cheese plate. So she explained what the three of them were. I think she said this is a blue that has like cranberries and walnuts. Uh, uh, this is a cheddar and this one in the middle. I don't care what this is. I just like the onion jam on it. So you go first. I want to see how I'm supposed to do this. And I'll just partake of my snake bite. Yeah, I like um, the look of the onion jam. It's very much like chutney. Do you have chutney in the snake? I'm sure we do, but I just don't know where it is. <laughs> Um, so it is, it is like a savoury jam, I suppose. But actually, it's it tends to be very sweet as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, cheddar's nice. You've got sort of the the Irish. We're friends. You can use your fingers. That's fine. I don't care. Don't be dainty. We're in the UK. <laughs> you're, supposed to be, so. you're supposed to be dainty. Yes. <laughs> but you're in a pub, so. Um, but it's interesting because the pickles. With the um, with the was that the cheddar with chives? They're actually the small gherkin type of pickles. Whereas I was thinking it was going to be more like you kind of almost like the onion jam. Um, but it's a very interesting dish. Oh my god! I'm making a mess. Oh, the blue cheese is lovely. Really strong. I'm a great fan of strong cheese. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I love blue cheese. And it's nice. I didn't expect the bread to be as, as hard. It almost, it almost is like, in a good way, like stale bread. Like it's hard. The cheese is very, very strong blue. But you cut it. With the sweetness of the nuts and the cranberries. Those can, uh, candied mm-hmm. walnut, was it? Lovely. That is lovely with that cheese. You can cancel my entrees. I'll just eat this. I'm going home to make this. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's really good. And I can see how... Because I know when I was at Remy on the cruise ship, cheese was a dessert. So I can see why. And, and just as a quick aside... You pair cheese with the white with the right wines, it becomes a dessert experience. Like it really, the cheese accents the wine, which changes the flavor of the cheese. But this is really, really good. But I need to move on to this other one because I'm an onion guy. So this, I don't remember what she said, but it has sort of a, a honey drizzle. It looks like. I think the I think the middle one was an Irish cheddar. Okay. Um, 
cheddar's nice, you know, it's kind of, it's a, quite a standard cheese, so if you're, if you're sort of making sandwiches, um, that kind of thing, you'll normally use cheddar. Um, oh my god, these onions look so good, they almost look as though they're a, a caramelised onion, but just by the, con- oh my god, you can smell it, it smells so good. Mm. Oh. Mm-hmm. The onions are sweet and almost like a, a, a caramely, like with the honey. And the cheese is very silky, very creamy, and it's not harsh at all. It's very, very, very mild. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> um it's a lovely taste and again I'm surprised that they don't do it almost as a dessert Mm -hmm. because it is very sweet yeah I'd like it at the end of the meal yeah 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 I almost feel like I'm having my dessert first yeah which is fine I'm a big boy I can do it this way and this third cheese now what do I do with those pickles am I supposed to have them like with the cheese do I put it on the cheese is it a post cheese oh my god I almost dropped my cheddar. Um, I would tend to probably have a, a bite of the pickle and then have a bite of the cheese. So you've probably, the cheese is probably quite sweet. And obviously you've then got the pickle, which is going to be quite sour. But yeah, these are very, very tiny little, like, inch-long baby gherkin. Sour. Mmm. Mm hmm. Oh my god, I'm so happy. Mmm. <laughs> That's a nice balance there of the, of the sour and then the creaminess of the cheese and the crunchiness of the, the toast. Yeah, I'm gonna try one now. Yeah, that's lovely. It really does balance balance the two together. Three completely different textures and flavors. I don't. I, I thought. I don't. Well, now wait a minute. It's either. It may be the blue, maybe my favorite, but that but that onion jam is really good. I think actually I like the blue, but I think that last one, the cheddar with chives, I think it is a winner for me. And it's really interesting because. You know, you sort of think of cheeses and you think, oh, it's, you know, they're all going to be similar tastes, but all three of those have got completely different tastes. Yeah, this is like, you know, this may be the secret of coming here. You come, you get a beverage, alcoholic or not, have a couple of appetizers. I could eat this all day long and I'm actually going to go back for more. Here, we'll break this little piece of toast in half. I'm going back. It's sorry. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to use the cheese as glue <laughs> to, to get the cranberries on here. All right, I need both hands. I have to put the, the recorder down. Mm-hmm. I like that a lot. And I really do like um, snacking food, Mm -hmm. you know. I like, um, funny enough, at Christmas, a tradition, sort of in England anyway, is you have your turkey on Christmas Day, and then... um, that the Christmas Day evening or the next day you will have a lot of cold foods so you'll have the turkey cold and you'll have like maybe your scotch eggs and things and lots of cheeses so that's what it reminds me of it's just that sort of like snacking on sort of everything that you've got left in the fridge I think this is what makes meals fun with friends and family right you're picking you're sharing you're comparing as opposed to I've got this giant plate of meat that I need to eat I like this. I think this is where good conversation and, and good times are had, uh, just sort of sharing appetizers. It's one of the things I like doing at Walt Disney World is going to 
restaurants or lounges and just going to Sanaa, grabbing a bunch of appetizers and just making it, oh my God, Holly, this is so good. Why don't you, I, this is the best kept secret in Walt Disney World. I think I'd agree with that. I was just saying, to come in here and have a, and have a, a drink, alcoholic or otherwise, sharing appetizers with friends or family, I could sit here and do this all night long. Uh, the other secret we have here is that the cheese plate can actually be ordered in the bar. What? So if you're coming in just to have a drink, you don't actually have to sit down and have a meal. We serve the scotch egg and the cheese plate oh in the bar, as well as a half-sized portion of the fish and chips. Come on. There you go. Shut yep. the front door. <laughs> it all comes out of our main kitchen, so it is this stuff right here. So it's still the cod in there, so that you get a half-sized portion of it, and you can sit down at any of the bar tables or just stand at the bar and have a munch. There's a future WW Radio Meet of the Month going to take Take place at the Rose and Crown bar area, not for the alcoholic beverages, but just for the appetizers. Well, that's it. We're famous for the alcohol, obviously, here. We're only full-service bar in Epcot, so... Pretty and much. this is really good. I, I'm not a huge beer drinker, but it, it's got a, a nice sweetness to it. It's from the cider. The cider is much, much sweeter. Uh, snake bites are actually banned in certain towns in uh, the United Kingdom. A lot of college bars aren't allowed to serve them because... They're so easy to drink. So on a night out, all the universities... See, Emma's had the same night out that I have. I was saying, yeah, like, um, I was, so bad. they're quite popular with sort of the teenagers. Yes. It's like your first drink. Exactly. I, I heard about a, a shandy. Do you guys have shandy, like the same kind of thing? Yeah. Is it like lemonade? And Who drinks lemonade and beer? It's a kind of start, you know. It's not an starter, American lemonade. It's okay. bright and bit. Oh, it's bright yeah. and bitter. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, because Which is just as bad, but that's okay. Don't be surprised. It's like anyone that drinks a wine do you get set. right? Do you get beaten up if you order a shandy in a bar? Uh, <laughs> Emma saying yes. <laughs> I, I take shandies to school because you can buy them in cans at the supermarket. And it used to be part of my packed lunch because you could get really low content ones. And so genuinely, instead of taking Coke to school, I had a shandy in my packed lunch from the age of about 14. So... But yeah, the, the snake bites is, uh, I'm sort of saying, it's a popular sort of like nightclub, yeah. sort of go and see there that. It's almost like the gateway drink to exactly. the harder stuff. It yeah. is. As, as most people start on the light beers and develop into the darker beers, the Guinness and things. The same with the cider is much easier to drink because it's much sweeter than some of the lagers. So you start on cider, then you mix it with a lager and then move up through the scale. And you have uh, like samplers and stuff like that too, where you do a number of different yeah, like pours. we have an uh, imperial sampler set, which is five five-ounce beers, although it's technically four beers and a cider. It would carry all the domestic ones, domestic from the UK. So you have Bass, Boddington's, Harp and Guinness for your four beers, and then the Strongbow in the middle. The only thing that we carry on tap here that we don't include is Stella, because it's actually from Belgium. We carry it because it's the largest imported beer into the United Kingdom. It's the biggest selling beer every year, hands down. And because there's not a Belgium on the World Showcase, we're not trading on anyone's toes. So it's a very well-known beer, especially as well in um, so, uh, South America. So a lot, obviously there's a large Brazilian Portuguese following here and they all recognize Stella so that's one of the many reasons that we carry it here yeah, we're, we're debating which cheese we like because they're three very very different yeah. flavors and textures I love that onion jam but that, that the sharpness it's got a real sharp blue cheese too I dig this a lot well, I'm glad you're enjoying it I say each, each one we try to put the pairings very carefully together so that they complement the cheeses really well yeah they work they work you have a new I, I'm a new huge <laughs> fan <laughs> I'll let you enjoy, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, and like you're doing, you just eat it with... Mmm. You don't even need the bread. No, it'd be a really nice thing to do. One afternoon, try and get a quiet day in Epcot. Come and sit in here, have a couple of drinks, and at the bar and have this cheese and the scotch egg. A lovely, quiet afternoon. Even, what about this? You get here about 8 o'clock. It's a slow time of year. You sit outside, you have a nice beverage, you have some cheese, and then they start fireworks on the lagoon in front of you. That's the, um, that's the quaint side of the UK, you know. Perhaps, you know, if you're on holiday in the UK and you're going out on a summer's evening, it would feel like that. I love this country. I love the United Kingdom. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you a little bit of this, of this onion stuff, but I am... Truly in love with this. Mm. It's almost like candy. Yeah, so you you sort of um, forget how nice it is until you take the ne the next mm. mouthful, and it's like, oh yeah, you remember how nice it is. Lovely. Check, please. I'm done. I'm good. <laughs> I don't even need to have my meal. 
Everything looks phenomenal. We fell in love with all the appetizers. But this look, so you aren't kidding. Mushy peas look like their name. They are mushy peas. Consistency is a mashed potato is how it comes out in the end. Then on your dish, you've got the cod, which is the fish, and the bass beer battered sauce. The steak, which is a New York strip steak on mashed potatoes. Then what you have here, it's not quite sure what you'd suggest that it would look like, but it's a Yorkshire pudding, which is a mixture of eggs, flour, and milk cooked at a very low temperature in a muffin pan. And it rises up and deflates like a souffle does. We then put a little bit of gravy on it. We use it as how you'd use it in the South, as you use a biscuit. So you kind of like mop up the plate with everything afterwards. And as good as it smells, I can smell the curry from across the table. Yeah, that will clear the sinuses right up the curry. Here it's a medium heat that we use. The white sauce over the top is a raita, uh, which has got a mixture of fresh, fr- uh, fresh vegetables in it. And it's a yogurt sauce, so it's a cooling sauce. So where the curry has got a medium heat to it, the yogurt will help cool it down and reflect the taste buds for a little bit. And the, curry, the vegetables on the side are cooked in a curry sauce. So a little curry spice, just give them a bit of oomph and the rice on the side. All right, is there anything else I can help with at the moment? I think we're good. Good, excellent. Enjoy your meals. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to try and eat and record at the same time. I'm, I'm going to try the, the English surf and turf first, which I assume to be just a normal, regular New York strip kind of steak. It looks like a, a good, good piece of steak, mm. though. And what do you call this? This little. That's a Yorkshire pudding. Okay. Traditionally, it's served with your Sunday dinner. So your roast dinner, um, your your meat, your roast potatoes, um, your veg, and your Yorkshire pudding, and that's a very sort of traditional Sunday English dinner. I get the feeling this is sort of comfort food. Like this is sort of what you have. Um, you know, like you said, like like on a Sunday with your family, I'm gonna do I'm gonna do it right now. I'm gonna do you proud. I put a whole hopping bunch of malt vinegar on top of my fish because when in England, do as the English do, and that's how I like it anyway. And I can see already how different she's right it is than what you get outside at Yorkshire, uh, the fish cart. Hmm. It's much meatier fish than what's outside. Yeah, I was surprised um, that it's actually the cod that they serve in here um, because that's very, it's a lot more common. That's, that would be your battered fish normally. Um, and I've also got started on the mushy peas. So I just love mushy peas. And again, it's what you'd normally have with your fish and chips from, from the fish and chip shop. Um, they wouldn't normally be served with either of the two dishes that we've ordered. But again, what would you eat it with normally? It would be with your with your fish and chips. Um, so you, your battered fish, um, and you'd kind of have a, a, a big, huge chunk of like mushy peas at the same time. I'm smiling because it looks like baby food, but it's delicious. It's really good, and I and the consistency is not what I expected. Um, again. It, do you know mushy peas vary as well so um, different fish and chip shops will make them up differently so you'll get some that are a lot more and um, there's a lot more liquid with them so this is this is uh, as she said as Holly said it's the consistency of mashed potato almost um, quite often you'll get them and they won't be as sort of mashed together I like this and if you're coming to the UK and want to sort of get a very easy you know sort of the, the and there's a lot of food here like that's a big piece of steak a really big piece of fish the Yorkshire pudding the string beans a, a large portion of mashed potatoes too like you could almost split this uh, I'll call it the, the surf and turf meal between two people yeah I like the way that it gives you a lot of flavors there there's a um, a lot of things to experience with the battered fish with the steak and with the Yorkshire pudding it's, it's a nice kind of dish for lots of different flavors so I, need to, I haven't tried the pudding yet. But how bad can it be with sort of a baked dough and and like she said, you sort of just mop up what what's in the plate with this. How is everything? Mm. Mm. <laughs> I'm making the yummy face. This is so good. This is this is you know I said it, it's English comfort food. Mm-hmm. Definitely. You, you gotta have steak. Uh, I love it. And I'm, a, and I'm a fan of the mushy peas. I'm a big fan of the mushy peas. You know, a lot of people aren't, but yeah. I think that they're amazing. 
it's very um, divisive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've, I've got a good friend who can't yeah. even look at mushy peas. If you like, you have to like peas. Obviously, if you like yeah. peas, you'll like mushy peas. Yeah, I think that the it's got a little bit of mint it's a fresh yeah thank you alright well if you need anything again let me know thank you you're welcome I want to try the curry but I can't get away from how good this is so well I'm on the curry hmm? and it's lovely all right, let me move this to the side here. <laughs> if you can see what our, our table looks like, it looks like there's 18 people eating here. It's really creamy. It smells great, but with, it doesn't smell like it's, a, it's, a, it's an overly hot kind of a, of a curry. No, it's, it's uh, a spicy. Mmm. Ooh. And again, this is not... You, you know, you think curry, you think, oh, um, I should go to Morocco for food with curry. <laughs> Emma, this is really good. Yeah. Holy smokes. Mmm. And it's not... I know some people, when they hear curry... And they back away with this is not scary at all. No, it's um, and I think masala is normally quite hot, so this may be perhaps not hot enough for some people if they were coming over from the UK. Um, but for me, it's nice, it's really creamy. There's just a, a little bit of a kick there, but nothing too much. Um, it's a, I mean, the, the, the meat in it is is crazy you know there's there's big chunks of chicken in there and i'm cutting it with a fork like i'm not i don't have to even use my knife to cut it it's very moist too yeah it's um it's a a really good dish really impressed with it and also um you know you can get a variety of sort of indian restaurants and and the standard dishes can be um uh, quite sort of you know completely different as well um this is definitely a sort of high-end curry dish This is very, very, very unexpected. I think people think UK, they're thinking fish and chips, they're thinking shepherd's pie, they're thinking sort of very heavy, sort of, like you said, comforty foods like that. Um, I, may, I think I like this better, because I can get a steak anywhere. The fish and chips is very good, I like the cod. I do like it better in here than outside. But... I like this curry dish a lot. So right now my perfect meal is the cheese, the scotch egg, and the curry. That's a strange mix. And I'm going to get some mushy peas too, just because I, I dig those too. And if you have an infant, you can serve them mushy peas as well. So uh, Holly, I have to tell you, <clears throat> I, I loved my, my English surf and turf, but I was blown away with the curry. I didn't expect it, but it was phenomenal. It had just the right amount of, like, not even heat, a little bit of zip on the back end. The chicken was moist. It was tender. It was really, really meaty. And I know it, it's an odd combination, but the scotch egg and the cheese and the curry and my mushy peas, like, it, it, and I think that's what I like about it is it's such a variety of flavors and textures that um, it was very... Um, it was an unexpected surprise. The UK itself these days is very much a mixing bowl of different nationalities and everything else, with the EU being such an open-door policy. It's the same in the United States, as Europe is much the same sort of... But whereas you have states, we have different countries, and each mix very well. So as we had a lot of Indian people come across, we have a lot of heat and spice coming into the diets. And, you know, we get lighter bits from the French and the Spanish and things like that. So we do have a wide variety of foods that we have to offer. The curry itself has been... We've had it on the menu for about two years now. It's gone through a lot of changes. So anyone that had it to start off with, it wasn't so good. I'm not going to lie to you. It originally came in a very large bowl. The chicken was on the bone, which is a... Not a great thing. Uh, personally, I'm not a big fan of meat on the bone, uh, especially when it comes to chicken, it's too fiddly. Too much work, yeah. Yeah, very, very fiddly for not enough meat. Um, so I'd say anyone that had it a couple of years ago, it has changed an awful lot since then. But 
because I don't I don't think I've ever had a curry at home where it's come on the bone. I think you'd probably agree with me. It's always chunks, yeah. chunks of meat. So and I, I said to Emma, I was able to cut it with my fork. Yeah. Oh yeah. The meat here is very, very tender. Unless you have your steak well done, you don't even need a steak knife. We provide them for you if you, you know, but you very rarely do. And the steak here is actually very. Uh, it's the same company that sends them here that they send to Canada for La Salier. Oh, okay. So and we have had a number of people say that our steaks are just as good as theirs, if not better. Yeah. yeah and there's a lot. The other thing too is. There's a lot of, and I mean this as a, in a good way. There's a lot of food on the plate. You know, the uh, the plate that I have, which is the strip steak and fried fish, Yorkshire pudding, mashed potatoes, the vegetables, red wine sauce. It's it comes in about thirty dollars, and you could almost split this between two people. Yeah, we, have, we have a lot of people that choose to split that, so they'll have an appetizer and then split that as their main meal, and then have a dessert afterwards. So that way they can have a number of different things to eat. But I say the steak is the same size as the New York strip if you order it on its own. Uh, the fish is a half size portion of our fish and chips, so it's about a three ounce piece of fish. It's the same size that you'd actually get in the bar if you were to order it in that. Yeah, and again, meaty but moist flaky it's not a heavy fry on it too like i didn't feel like it wasn't greasy at all uh but you said a magic word in there somewhere uh and believe it or not i I think that we have an obligation for dessert so you're gonna have to help me here because you've got mandy's mess which is pound cake with seasonal fruit a bakewell tart with spiced creme fraiche and bees honey mead syrup no sugar added yogurt parfait which sounds way too healthy for tonight a Jaffa tart Jaffa tart Jaffa tart orange cream filled cakes with chocolate ganache raspberry sauce and fresh oranges Oh, and that little thing called the sticky toffee pudding. Well, you actually have someone that's already helped you out with this one, as I believe you have a friend named Carol Stein, who is our wonderful hat lady in the pub. Uh, She's actually already spoken to the chef, and they're going to send you out a variety of each of the desserts so that you can try a little bit of each of them. Uh, So what do you you, you have on there? The Jaffa tarts are a play on the Jaffa cakes, which are a very popular cookie in in the UK. We can't call them Jaffa cakes because that is a brand name, so ours are Jaffa tarts, and they're handmade. Uh, so what it is is we make an orange cake and then we dip it in a chocolate sauce. It's a dark chocolate. And then we have a candied orange on the side with a little bit of raspberry sauce. Then the sticky toffee pudding is probably the most famous of the desserts we have. It's the best seller in and out. It is the only thing that has remained on the menu for the entire eight years that I have been here and hasn't gone anywhere. Uh, so it is a steamed cake. The word pudding throws off a lot of Americans. Uh, pudding here is a liquid format. Uh, in the UK, pudding just describes dessert. So essentially, to put it in an American term, it's sticky toffee dessert. So, but I say it's a steam cake, comes on a bed of vanilla custard with a toffee rum sauce over the top, and we use a Myers dark rum to give it a really nice flavour. So, uh, Mandy's Mess is the pound cake, so it's a vanilla cake. The seasonal fruits with it at the moment are strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, and it comes with a Ribena syrup on the side. It's a, like mixed in with a creme fraiche. Uh, Ribena is something that Brits are very common with. Uh, what grenadine is to cherries, uh, blackberries are to Ribena. So it's a Ribena syrup, but what it is in the UK is it's essentially a little like Kool-Aid. So you add it to the bottom of a glass and then fill it up with water. The big difference is you don't add any sugar into it. So it's actually a soft drink that children have at home. I am so excited and I love Carol Stein. <laughs> oh my I gosh, what a, nice su- what a nice surprise. Yeah, so, so she's fantastic. I love Carol a bit. So the Comedy Warehouse is lost while PI's lost was our game, very much so. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, she's a lot of fun and incredibly talented, you know. She's now here Tuesdays through Saturday. Okay. Yeah, five nights straight, which is nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's very sweet, too. And she's an incredible, she's incredibly talented as well. We walked in before, she starts ad-libbing a song and throwing my name into it and just, you know, having a blast. So. She's fantastic. So is there anything else I can get for you at the moment? Uh, yes. If you could get me a pillow and a blanket, I want to just lay right here and take a nap. <laughs> okay, right. That's what you need here, really. Well, my mum, I keep telling her she should compile it into a book. She should do Where to Sleep at Walt Disney World, because my mum has it down to a fine art. So she gets too tired these days doing the whole parts, but she knows where every rocking chair is, where every movie theatre with, like, really comfy seats are, where she can have a power nap, which rides are quiet that she can nap on. So, yeah, you need to talk to her. She'll tell you how to get around the World Showcase in, like, 40 winks. Wow, so. that sounds like a top ten segment, please. The top ten places to take a quick nap in World Showcase. We often just leave her somewhere and we pick her up an hour later and she's ready to go again, which is great. You know, she, that way she enjoys her day and we enjoy ours. So. That's it. This has been phenomenal so far. Really, really enjoying it. Thank you. So, Holly, you just brought me a sample of Ribena. Yeah, Ribena. And it's... And you, it's a, it's sort of like a, in a small pill. What, what is it? 
Ribena is a syrup, so it's like grenadine, but it's a blackberry syrup. You can just add water to it. It's got no sugar in it, so it's very good for you. It's actually a children's soft drink back in the UK. But we use it to dress a number of our desserts, uh, and we also use it in the beer. So what I've done here is I've added a little bit of snake bite to it, and it becomes what's known as a diesel in the UK. Diesel? Diesel, yeah. So. All right, wait, let me try this here. Okay. And this is normally, it's, it's like... You have with your meal, or is it like a dessert? Or? No, no, it's, you drink it the same as you drink any beer. Uh, we do a lot of flavoured ciders in the UK as well. You do like a strawberry and a kiwi and things like that. Freshens it up. It's really good, especially in the hot summers here. It's really nice and refreshing. Oh, my God, that's so good. And again, very easy to drink, very popular with teenagers. Yeah. Yeah, so, well, it should, kids, don't try this at home. Uh, here in the United States, it is 21 and older here at Epcot Center. Um, but you're right, this could be, and I use air quotes, dangerous in the summer. Yeah. It's hot, it goes down smooth, you're like, there's no alcohol in this, let me have six more. A lot of the times people will drink the first half and then they'll top it up with ice to keep the rest of it cold so that you can take it off around the World Showcase, so... So this one is, is mixed in with the snake bite, and this yep. one is just the drink and then this by is itself. The, yeah, this is what you'd grow up on as a child. So this is just Ribena, so it's purely the Ribena syrup with water. Yeah, it's like... Um, I can't even say it's like a Kool-Aid, but... It's, like, I, it's I, just I, like Kool-Aid, but there is no bitterness to it that yeah, you have to... Yeah, that's right, there's no bitterness. And there's no sugar in it at all. So if you just purely put, have the liquid at the bottom and then top it up, you can make it as strong or as weak as you want. But I say it's very popular with children because it's got no sugar in it. It doesn't make them hyper. It's not soda. It's good for. It's relatively good for them in many facts. It doesn't hurt their teeth in the same way. And, I, and there's nothing like this that I know of here in the States. I've not been able to find anything. If you're in Florida because of the expat community here, you can purchase it in Walmart. Uh, yep, I have them at home. There's also a large collection of them. There's orange drinks. There's fruit and barley. At home, you'd have, you've got a whole aisle of the supermarket here where you've got the aisle of soda and you've got water on one side at home you've got three quarters soda three quarters water and then a decent selection of cordials so yeah I would love to get this for my kids I'll yeah. bet you they would really like this it's absolutely great it comes in a big bottle and then you, you can make it as strong or as weak as you want but I say it's, so you, you don't drink it straight out of the bottle you always mix it no it's, uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't drink straight grenadine so I say that's the only thing that's the best thing I can find in the states to compare it to but I say it's fantastic but because of the expat community here you can get it in Publix Walmart and any of the international supermarkets they have a wide variety of it so my personal favourite is the fruit and barley it's got a slightly pinker taste to it but I say it's really good that one and this, and this you said is blackberry that one's a blackberry yeah it's a blackberry that's nice with the beer yeah so that's a ribena so isn't it it's fantastic so we add it to the, either to the snake bite and it makes it a diesel or it's also found on our menu under the cider and black wow thank you this is a nice little treat <laughs> Um, the area that I live in, we call it a snake bite and black. Yeah, that's it. Okay. There's, a, there's a few different variations to it, but generally, if you come into the pub, we're more than happy to make it for you. So yeah. Oh, this is good. This is this is a uh, a night of many surprises. <laughs> I feel like it's a pleasant surprises. That's the main thing that we aim for her. So I'll let you guys carry. Can I get any of this out of the way for you? I, I think. Working on it all. I think I'm done. I'm I'm done. ready for our. Uh, I'm ready to sample our desserts. Yeah. Thank you. So our sticky toffee pudding, it's kind of like um, one of the top sellers here. So it's a date cake on the bottom is a custard, uh, topped with a rum caramel sauce. We move over here to our bake wall tart, which is layered of raspberry and almond frangipan, um, topped with a mead syrup and a little creme fraiche with a little hint of uh, pumpkin spice. Then we have our Jaffa tarts, which are actually taken from the cake that they, they use over in, in England. So they're usually called the Jaffa Cakes instead of the Jaffa Tarts, which are cookies. Uh, so we have an orange filling with a yellow cake topped with ch uh, a little chocolate sauce and then raspberry sauce, um, chocolate sauce, orange segments, and candied orange. So I hope you enjoy. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Wow, Chef, thanks. This, I, it, it looks like a work of art. I almost, I almost don't want to eat it, but I will. Awesome. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed everything. Thank you for joining us tonight. The Rose. Chef, it was, everything was phenomenal. I was just saying, Emma's from the UK. We're here sort of comparing what the food is here to what she's used to back home. It seems to be a, a great representation. And I, I said it was a really, it was a nice surprise because it wasn't what I was expecting. Awesome. Well, we, we're trying to bring that authenticity uh, to the Rose and Crown uh, so you get that authentic experience, especially from being from the UK. It's, it's really, um, it brings you home. This is what this whole place is about. 
you know, speaking the story, talking about the story and what, what Rosen Crown in this area of Epcot is all about. It's been wonderful. It has been phenomenal. I've, uh, you, I have a, you have a new fan of, of Rosen Crown. I'm very glad. Thank you very much. Awesome. Jeff, thanks so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. I didn't even hear a word he said because I was just sort of staring. This looks so good. I don't know where to start. Um, Bakewell Tart. I'm a massive fan of Bakewell Tart. Um, and again, uh, you can get it homemade. You can get shop bought. You can get it sort of packaged. Um, the Jaffa Cakes or Jaffa Tarts, they're called here. Um, they're, again... A, a, well, we call them biscuits, you call them cookies, um, but they look amazing, and the sticky toffee pudding, just, yeah, this is this is um, a great dish. <laughs> All right, so why don't we, we'll, we'll go in that order, why don't we start off with the Bakewell tart, and which I, I don't even know sort of how to compare it to, because it almost looks like, like a French or Italian pastry, almost. Yeah, it's quite similar to that. Um, it normally has quite a sort of strong almond taste to it. I'm not sure if this does. And this has sort of the, the creme fraiche with it, which I have to... Yeah, very almondy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lovely. Ooh, yeah. Very, um, it's moist, very sort of wet almost. Lovely. It's dense. Uh, I expect it to be very dry, and it's not. And with the creme fraiche and that fruit, oh, yeah, that's nice. Give me, give me a nice cup of coffee with that. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's and again, that's the thing is that um, it's um, quite a common cake to have, sort of like I don't know, a cup of tea in the afternoon and a slice of Bakewell tart. Lovely. Wow, that's very good. A Bakewell tart, Crème fresh bees honey mead syrup. That's five forty nine. That's really good, and and it's it's big enough and I think dense enough that you could you can share it too. Yeah. Uh, got nothing more to say apart from it's perfect <laughs> I don't know if I should keep eating that or move on to I'm going to move past the fruit because that's just that's going to take up time and space let's um, I'm going to go over to the Jaffa tart these these cream filled cakes that almost look like you can pick them up but oh okay it's not what I was expecting they're soft Mmm. Oh, Holly, I just was introduced to the Bakewell tart. Very good, man. Yeah, it's amazing. And it's it's a lot moister than, than I think I've sort of had in the past. Yeah, it's also the fact it's very close to like a Mr. Kipling one, which is what we traditionally have at home. But ours are made fresh as a cake every morning, which is why they've got that little bit more flavour to them. They're a little bit moister, so it's really good. That one's, I think, the hidden gem on our dessert list, yeah. to be honest. Uh, it's very sweet. It's a marzipan top to it, which is all the sweet to it. But it's got the jam and the sort of the, the sort of the vanilla cake in the middle of it to kind of even it all out. When I felt how dense it was as I was cutting it with my spoon, I thought it was going to be very dry, and it's not. Then the creme fraiche and the jam is really. Nice. I'd say it's a really good mix of flavors. It's very difficult to almost explain a Bakewell tart because someone hears tart and they think of something very different. Right, right. But I say it's a really nice piece, very sweet, but a hidden gem on our menu. Yeah, really nice texture, just sort of when you put it in your mouth. And I just had my first taste of the Jaffa tart, and I'm going back for more. <laughs> Because I was expecting almost like a hard cookie, and it's not. It's almost like a soft cake. It is a soft cake here. Uh, if you were to have the traditional Jaffa cake, then yes, it is more like a cookie. Um, however, ironically, is the story with Jaffa cakes is that they are a cake, not a cookie, because a cake, when you leave it out in the sun, it goes hard, whereas a cookie, if you leave it out in the sun, it goes moist. And uh, in the UK, cookies are actually taxed at a higher rate than cakes. And Jaffa cakes went to the high court in Europe to protest that they were a cake and not a cookie, so they had to pay it. They didn't have to pay the higher tax rate. And by doing it, they argued that when you leave a Jaffa cake out, it goes hard rather than whereas a cookie will go soft. I have to stop you for a second because I love the fact that not only do you know every little detail about the menu, but the fact that you're able to share stories about the individual items, you don't know what a difference that makes in the dining experience. I, I kid you not. Um, I, I think 
when you go out to eat, it's not just about the company and the food, but your server and what they bring to the table, not just in terms of food, but in terms of the story and why things are the way they are, it makes a huge, huge difference. Yes, well, as a server, personally, I try and tailor it to the table. You have some tables that when they come out, they just want to be there to talk to each other, in which case you just touch with the table on a regular basis, make sure their meal is good and give them time. We get a lot of family reunions here. Uh, We're a very good restaurant for being able to cater for 12, 14, wedding parties, things like that. So those sort of tables that we're very sort of hands-off with. We also have tables that are very interested in where we are. I had a table about six months ago. They came in in the summer, and they were off to Northampton, in fact, where my parents live. When they got there, they actually looked my parents up in the phone book and called them to tell them about their experience here at the Rose and Crown. My mum, they weren't at home at the time, and my mum came home to this answer phone message and was like, who are these people calling me? So, but no, it's, it's great. As I say, we do try very much here to tailor it to everyone's personal preference. Well, that's, that's a testament to you. As a certain, Look, not every server is... It's like, like not every Jungle Cruise skipper is the same. Not every server is the same, so you are exceptional. It's the same thing. Not every not every table is the same, and it's very much what one table wants, another doesn't. So we try and do our very best to accommodate for it. I'm loving it. Well, you might as well listen as long as just have a seat. Might as well. I might as well dig into the sticky sticky topping. Sticky topping, because that's a beautiful one. I'll let you enjoy. Thank you. So you you cut into it with your spoon, and it's just moist and gooey and. Everything is just sort of drip. Oh my god! Oh, mm-hmm. That's the sticky toffee pudding. I think is the one that's the closest to the what you expect it to taste like coming from the UK. Um, I mean, they're all amazing dishes. Um, I love the interpretation of the Jaffa tart, and I think that everyone from the UK would say, "Yeah, but it's not what we're expecting." But actually, when you taste it. It's got the same taste as what we expect. And the, um, the sticky toffee pudding uh, is really light. Um, and, you know, it's it's that kind of cold winter's evening, yeah, yeah. sitting in front of the TV <laughs> with your cup of hot tea and a nice bowl of sticky toffee pudding and, and custard. Lovely. Yeah, and for us who have never had it before, we have obviously no frame of reference, but this uh, this sticky toffee pudding... It, it literally just sort of melts on your tongue when you put it in. Mm-hmm. It's sweet. It's moist. It's it's decadent. I mean, it, it is incredibly savory too, but not so much that it's too sweet that you can't eat it. It's um. So I guess it is. It's. It's almost kind of like a, a muffin or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. It's like a muffin that's heated up. Yeah, and, that's and that's a great way to talk about the consistency of it, yeah. Yeah, heated up in, in sort of like a syrup almost. I don't know what my favourite is. I might have to go back and try the little Jaffa cake again just for fun. Okay, I'm going to go back to the I see why. This is the uh, the most popular item on the dessert menu. Mm-hmm. It's the Bakewell tart for me. That kick yeah. of flavour is lovely, really lovely. And so when I have my tea, am I supposed to have it? What am I? How do I have my tea? Milk, sugar. Yep. So you're having a hot cup of tea in a nice big mug. Um, and also, it really depends. Some people like a really milky tea. Other people like it strong. Um, you can get a Yorkshire tea, which is like a really strong sort of tea. Um, you know, and it's just it's just nice to have a nice big cup of tea and a, and a piece of one of these cakes. So am I doing it wrong because I don't put milk in my tea? So you have hot tea, black? Black. That's quite unusual. Yeah, I've never, I've never had tea. I, sometimes I'll have like black tea or green tea with sugar or honey. Yeah, um, but mm, mm, tea, hot tea. I've lost all credibility. <laughs> hot tea is more often drunk with milk. I think it's more common for coffee to 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 be black. Um, but the the tea and it would be it's proper milk, not creamer or anything. You know, it's it's proper milk, um, and then you just you brew the tea for how strong you want it. Again, uh, in summation, I've learned a lot. Uh, 
But you know, when we were talking as we were in between eating, you mentioned how in the past you, you've walked by here and you've looked at the menu and it didn't really pique your interest, but your opinion has changed after tonight. Yeah, I looked at the dishes and perhaps coming from the UK, I wanted to see the really traditional dishes. And I know that they do change the menu quite often, as Holly said. And, um, you know, like I would expect there to be sort of the the roast dinner and the bangers and mash and things. And, you know, I'd, I'd want something to really grab my attention. But actually, it's all about the taste. Now that I've sampled the dishes, I realise that the descriptions are second place to the taste. It is really all about the taste in these dishes. So you would, you would not only eat here again, you'd recommend it? Definitely, yeah. Um, the masala was lovely. Um, the, the cheeses and the, um, and, and the scotch egg were lovely. Um, and the desserts are amazing. So I, I will tell you, when I think of World Showcase and places that I like to eat, my mind always went to Japan. Um, Le Cellier is obviously very popular with a lot of people. Um, Mexico, you know, you go to Mexico sometimes just for the ambiance. I always sort of overlooked Rose and Crown. I thought of it as a pub. I was like, yeah, it's going to have sort of fish and chips. And it really, honestly, Emma, it's sort of looking back at, at what we ate tonight and the other options that are on there. So if you go with other people that may be picky eaters or, hey, I'm, I don't want to be too adventurous, there's a lot of, there's a, a great variety. I think you get a lot of food. I think it's a good value considering how much food you get. Um, and I think it's interesting. I think you can really sort of test and expand your culinary palate a little bit because nothing is, uh, there's nothing scary on here. There's nothing that's like, you know what, I don't think so-and-so would like this because it's too X. Yeah, I think you've got the simple foods there. Um, and so, yeah, the, perhaps the, the dishes are simple to attract people here. It's a, you know, it's a popular place to eat. Um, and I think what they've done is they've almost taken a UK-based restaurant and combined it with a pub, you know? So it is much more like the pubs in UK that treat themselves as a restaurant as well. It's not just bar food. And it doesn't feel as though, and you can maybe speak to this better, it doesn't feel as though it's overly watered down for an American palate. Because I think you said, I think there's a, a, a huge variety of flavours uh, you know, on the spectrum. Yeah, I think so. I think um, that's been the standout thing for me is that the flavours, the taste of everything is is amazing. Um, and so I, I don't think it's kind of just like a, a, a an easy copy right. of, of UK food. I think they've really they've really made an effort with it. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm very very I'm I'm surprised and impressed. I mean surprised in a good way. Not that I had heard bad things about the menu. It just wasn't what I expected. And I think you're right. I think the descriptions almost do the food a disservice. And I don't mean that in a bad way. That's a compliment to the food itself. Yeah, uh, you know, it's what I said. Nothing has really... I've, I've read the menus before and thought, yeah, you know, they're okay. But actually, the dishes are a lot more exciting to eat yeah. than, the, than they are to read off the menu. Yeah. We talk about dining experiences, and sometimes you go to places because of the ambiance, because of the show, because of what you get. Here, I would be coming for the food. Like, I was like, all right, I want to go to Rosa Crown because I want the marsala again. I want the cheese. I want the dessert. There are specific things that I know that I want and other things on the menu that I know that I want to try. Yeah, and it's interesting because it is an, a noisy, um, busy atmosphere. You know, this isn't a, a calm restaurant. Um, but it's almost like you're concentrating so much on the food that this, the noise just blends into part of the atmosphere. And it's not overpowering. It's not like, you know, you go to some places like uh, a rainforest cafe or T-Rex cafe where you're surrounded by dinosaurs. That's a noisy environment. Here, it's it's what you would expect from a, a pub kind of restaurant. So, you know, you get, every, look, you get a screaming kid, every, you know, no matter where you go sometimes. Um, but yeah, like, I, I want to, like, come back. I want to almost, I feel like I want to take my friends, like, hey, you need, like, I've been to, you need to try someplace that you probably didn't have on your radar. Yes, certainly. It would be a, a nice place to kind of to invite a group of people to come and spend a couple of hours just trying things off the menu. And people forget there's entertainment. you got Carol Stein up front. You can go. There's a bunch of people, you know, hanging out in the pub. You can take your kids here. There's stuff on the kids' menu. 
And, and obviously, I'm going to use Holly as a shining example. The service has been exceptional, not just from Holly, but even the greeters outside. Uh, the manager came over at least two or three times over here to not just say how is everything, but sort of engage us in conversation too. And I'm really, really impressed with that. But that's what you expect from the UK. I was waiting for <laughs> now what we need to do is we need to go over to the UK and see how it compares to World Showcase. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You know, we uh, we need to go around and try traditional dishes in the UK. I'm going to have to come over and you'll have to be my tour guide over in uh, in the UK. This is this has been not just a lot of fun. It's been very enlightening for me. And if people who are listening have never been here or wrote it off or were here years ago and maybe said that this wasn't for you, I think you need to give the Rose and Crown, not just the pub, but the dining room, another shot. Yeah, I'll definitely be coming back because it's been a big surprise for me. Yeah, yeah. So, Emma, thank you so much. Congratulations on uh, you just, you're just you here for the marathon, both running and cheering, and uh, and this has been a lot of fun. Both And again, I'm going to link to our tour of the UK before, and now certainly uh, the fun that we've had. And, and look, there's still more sticky toffee pudding to be had. So, uh, God save the Queen. God save. It, you want to give out your Twitter in case people want to uh, follow you or anything? Yeah, sure. I'm uh, Pink Emma UK on Twitter, and uh, I'm, I try and get in the box as often as possible as well. Awesome. Yeah, this is great. And uh, again, make sure you check out Rose and Crown over at the United Kingdom, and I'm going to check out the. Uh, Holly, I'm just wrapping up. We were just saying the meal was exceptional. The the descriptions almost do it a disservice because the food is that good. And as good as the food has been, the service was over and above anything I could have expected. So thank you. You really helped make the experience really enjoyable for us. You are very, very welcome. I'm glad that you guys enjoyed it. So I know that we often get mixed reviews here, but... It's one of those things, Brits come here often with a different idea of what to expect. And I think that's what honestly does us more of a disservice than anything else. Is they come here with it very much set in their mind of what it's going to be. They order the fish and chips and think it should be just like they have in the chip shop at home or something like that. Whereas if you come for the meal on its own merit, on its, own merit it's a beautiful place to eat. Well, hopefully we've changed some people's minds and opened their eyes to something that they may have overlooked before. That's it. We also do a very different lunch menu as well. So it changes between the, the 3.30. So we do a full, full lunch, full dinner. And it's got a good selection on both. I will be back, I promise. <laughs> That's all right. I will probably still be here. I've been here for the last seven years. Hopefully I'll be here for many, many more. So if you won't find me here, you'll find me in the bar. I bartend as well. So. Thank you so much. And to both of you, God save the Queen. Cheerio. Time for our Walt Disney World Trivia Question of the Week, where I invite you to test your knowledge of Walt Disney World history, see how well you pay attention to the details in what you see, or maybe in what you hear, for a chance to win a Disney prize package. Before we get to this week's question, let's go back, review last week's, and select our winner. So last week, as I was recording the show, my mind obviously turned to where it normally does, which is food, and I gave you a really easy question, I thought, and it was about the Be Our Guest restaurant in New Fantasyland over the Magic Kingdom. The question was simple. Just name for me the three dining rooms. They were, of course, the ballroom, the West Wing, and the library. And again, you were playing for all six of my audio walking tours of the Magic Kingdom, which you can find over at www.radio.com. A luggage tag, a button, and a signed copy of my Walt Disney World Trivia Book Volume 2. And last week's randomly selected winner is... James Knowles. So James, congratulations. Send me an email with your address. I'll get your package out to you right away. If you played last week and didn't win, that's okay because here's your next chance in this week's Walt Disney World Trivia Challenge. So I thought we would stick with the theme of the United Kingdom Pavilion and the Rose and Crown Pub. And your question this week is once again simple. Just tell me the motto of the Rose and Crown and what does it mean? You have until Sunday January 26th at 11.59 p.m. to email me at contest at wdwradio.com. Again, you're playing for the audio tours, a luggage tag, a button, a copy of the trivia book, Volume 2, and if you're our winner, I'll give you two free tickets to our WDW Radio 7th Anniversary Party 
on Friday, January 31st. We'll have details at the end of the show. So good luck and have fun. That's going to do it for this week's show. Thanks so much for taking the time and tuning in this and every week. Be sure to visit the website over at www.radio.com for our blog, videos, free newsletter, free iPhone and Android app, and of course, tune in every Wednesday night at 7.30 p.m. Eastern for www.radiolive.com. Watch, chat, real time as I discuss this week's Walt Disney World news. You can follow me on Twitter. I am at Lou Mangiello. And like the Facebook page at facebook.com slash Radio. You can call the voicemail at 407-900-9391 to be heard on the air. Or email me with a question you have to be answered on the show at lou at www.radio.com. And again, as much as I love connecting with you online, nothing beats a handshake and a hug. Check our events page over at www.radio.com for Meet to the Month. And of course, coming up in just a few days is the WDW Radio 7th Anniversary Weekend, including our 7th Anniversary Party and Live Show that I want you to be a part of. Tickets are on sale now for that event, and you can also find out how you can help direct what we do during our 7th Anniversary Quest around Disney's Hollywood Studios. Again, all the information can be found over on the events page at www.radio.com. Thanks to Mouse Fan Travel, not just for sponsoring the show, but for helping to sponsor the anniversary celebration as well. Whether you're coming down to Disney World, Land, Adventures by Disney, or Disney Cruise Line, Becky and her team of agents help you get the best possible prices, all available discounts at no cost to you with an incredible level of personal service as well. Visit them over at mousefantravel.com. And as always, my friends, and you are my friends, whether we have met yet or not, all I ask is that if you like the show, please help spread the word. Let others know about it. Tweet out that you're listening. Tweet to me at at Lou Mangiello. Come by, comment on Facebook, and share links to your favorite episodes there as well. And also, please come by, rate and review the show over in iTunes. It is very, very helpful and very much appreciated. Once again, my sincerest thanks go out to each and every one of you for letting me share my passion for Disney with you through the show and the videos and online, so many other ways. I I am truly blessed each and every day, and I want you right, to be able to do that as well with what it is that you love, whatever it is that may be, right? So if something matters enough to you, you're going to find a way to do what may have first seemed impossible. Never quit on what you want because you still have time to create your own fate. Don't be afraid to risk, leap, ask, and change, and never, ever settle. Have a great week, everybody. Thanks again. So until next time, see ya. Hi, Lou. This is Anna Collins from Abilene, Texas, and I was just calling. I just listened to your show for tonight, the 18th of December, and I am so excited. Um, my biggest, I guess my biggest um, Disney event for this year was I took my little three-year-old son to Disney World um, just for a little mini vacation for like two days in October, and it was awesome. Please stand clear of the doors. Hi, Lou. This is Sean out in Squim, Washington again. Just listened to your Mary Poppins episode, and I just wanted to call and reassure you that, you know, people do still stop and look at those little things. Last time we were at Disney World, about a year and a half ago, we were wandering around MGM Studios, or Hollywood Studios, and uh, on our way to the great movie ride, and out of the corner of our eye, we noticed that Mary Poppins display, and it just happens that uh, Mary Poppins is my sister's favorite, one of her favorite Disney movies, one of her favorite movies of all time, and probably her favorite Disney movie. She loves Julie Andrews, and so it was a nice little surprise. You know, it's not marked on the map, and it was one of those things that because we were slowed down a little bit and taking our time and just taking in the sights, uh, we were able to find. So I'm glad that... Uh, Glad that it's there and glad that other people know about it. And just do recommend people take some time and check out some of the sites along the way between places. Thanks and keep up the great work. Merry Christmas. 